Thank you. Oh, oh you're, you're too kind. <laughs> Welcome back to our little math theater. So, um, you guys doing all right? Yeah? Okay. So, um, last time, last time we started uh, to talk about parametric curves. And today we will continue, um, we will continue with this topic and um, we will learn various, various important um, things about parametric curves, such as tangent lines, um, arc length, and various areas of, of uh, surfaces which are obtained from parametric curves. So the first thing we will discuss today is tangent lines. And uh, this is actually very easy to introduce. This topic is very easy to introduce because this is something familiar from single variable calculus. In single variable calculus, In single variable calculus, we study graphs of functions, right? And so a graph of a function is something which we draw on the plane with two coordinates, x and y. And it, it looks something like this. Okay. And we usually write y equals f of x, right? Where f is a function, f is a function in one variable. So this is a graph, this is a graph of the function f of x. So now, Oftentimes, oftentimes in mathematics or in science and engineering, you want to know various approximate results about your objects. Your, your object may be too complicated, um, and you want to get sort of the first order approximation, as they say. Or it might be that just you want to understand it qualitatively. For example, let's say if this is the graph of the temperature in Berkeley, California, where x is a time, so let's say over the last week, you know. It actually would be more like this, I suppose. It's very hot last weekend, right? So then maybe you don't want to know exactly what the graph looks like, but you want to know, for example, the trends. Does the temperature increase? Does it decrease? Things like that. And for this, it's very useful to find some approximate tools, which would, you know, you'll be able to say a lot of things about your object without really, you know, getting 100% of the information about it. And tangent lines is the first thing that you you can use for that. And the reason is very simple. The reason is that out of all the curves that you can draw, out of all the curves, so this is, one, this is an example of a curve, but of course you can draw many more very complicated examples. I mean, circle and so on goes without saying, but even kind, kind of really wacky curves you can draw, right? Anything you want to, to draw, like a, a Picasso, you know? It's also, a it's also a curve, right, oftentimes. He oftentimes just drew it in one stroke. So out of all of these curves, there's a whole variety of those curves, and they're very complicated. But there is a very simple class. There is a class of the simplest ones, and those are the lines. The lines are the simple curves, OK? So lines are the simplest curves. And the um, equation of a line if uh, lines can be graphs of functions, and those functions usually look like this. It will be something like k times x minus x0 plus y0, where k is called the slope. k is called the slope, and uh, it's, it's a line with the slope k, and also a line which uh, passes through 
th through the point x0, y0. All right? So let's, let's, draw, let's draw it, actually, say here. So let's say this is x0, y0 on the plane. And the line is going to look something like this. OK? So to, to draw a line, what you need to know is a point uh, through which it passes and also the slope. What, what do I mean by the slope? The slope is the tangent of this angle. So in other words, you need to know the angle between this line and the x-axis. That's this angle, theta. And the tangent of this angle is called the slope. And that's what we call k in that formula, the slope of this line. So this is the simplest, this is the simplest graph and the simplest curve, really. I mean, what, what, what could be simpler than this? See, the point is, you are considering, on the right-hand side, you have a function of x. And the simplest function of x that you can write is a constant function. And then the next simplest function is a constant function plus a linear function, which is what we've written. But the constant function could also be thought of a special case of this. Namely, if k is equal to 0, slope 0, this will just disappear, and then you would have this. So in other words, the, the case of the function, constant function is included because you're allowed to have arbitrary k. So k equals 0 would give you the constant function. So that would be just a special case of this when y just equals y0. It's, a, it's also a line. It's a horizontal line. It has slope 0. It's just a special case of this. In some sense, there is no, po there is no point of distinguishing this case from this ge more general case of lines. So that's why I'm saying that the simplest curves that you can draw are the lines. Because dependence on x, dependence of the function f of x, is the simplest possible. It only contains a constant term and a linear term in x. In other words, degree 1. It doesn't have x squared, it doesn't have x cubed, not to mention you know, logarithms, cosines, and all those other complicated functions. OK, so that's the first fact, which we have to remember that out of all the curves, there are the simplest ones. These are the lines. And we know the equations of the lines that are given by this, by this formula. And so the next thing, the next idea of calculus, and we, really the most important idea maybe of all of calculus, is that for many, many functions, namely the so-called smooth functions or differentiable functions, you can approximate your function very well on a small scale by a, by a line. Or more precisely, approximate the graph of the function by a line. So two things, two ways to think about it. A, a, a smooth function can be approximated by a linear function like this, which geometrically means that the graph can be very nicely and usefully approximated by a line. And in practice, the way it works is that if we pick a point on this curve, and let's call it again x0 and y0, then we can we can think of a, a whole variety of lines which pass through this point. There are many of them. There are infinitely many, in fact, infinitely many lines. But out of all of those lines, there will be one line which will be the closest to this graph. And that's the tangent line. You see. So I, I forgot to bring my color chalk again, but uh, I guess I hope you, you get the idea. So this is. This is, the, this is the tangent line. And what's so special about this is that it is the closest one to the graph of the function. In the following sense, that if, if, you, slightly ch if you move it just slightly, it will, intersect, it will intersect the graph at two different points. You know, so if, if we blow this up. If you blow this up, it's going to look like this. And if I just blow up a very small neighborhood of this point, it's going to look like this. If I change it just, change it just slightly, you know, like this, it's, it already intersects it at, at two different points. So you, just, you adjust your line just so that it touches the graph at one point. That's intuitively what the tangent line is. Right? Tangent. Tangent line. The closest one. The closest of all lines to this graph, to this graph. 
at this particular point. If you change your reference point, of course, you're going to get a different one. In other words, here I'm talking about the tangent to this particular point, which is that point x0, y0 on the big picture. But if you, if you go on to a different place, if you go to a different place, here, for example, of course, you'll get a, an entirely different line. So when you talk about tangent line, you have to say tangent at which point. It, otherwise, it doesn't make any sense. Each point on the graph has its own tangent line, and a priori, they are all different. And in, most, in uh, almost all cases, they will be different. So this is not to say that this line can replace the graph of the function, because you see they diverge. If you go sufficiently far from this, from this point, they become different. You know this expression going off on the tangent? Yeah? Sometimes you'll catch me doing that, I suppose. Uh, anyone uh, is capable of doing that. And what it means precisely is that if you go off on a tangent, you will soon, soon enough you'll be far away from the object itself. But the good news is that as long as, as you are in a very small neighborhood of this point, the difference is almost negligible. And this is a key idea of calculus, really. And, uh, of calculus of single variable now, because we are talking now about functions in one variable. But you will see that the same idea will be applied very usefully also for multivariable functions. For example, if you have function two variables, you'll be approximating graphs by planes instead of lines, and so on. OK. So, so I hope I convince you of the importance of this, because what, what, does it give, what does it give you? For example, you see that. The function is, um, your function is increasing at this point, right, if, if the slope is, is positive like this, right, and uh, the, uh, the function is decreasing if the slope is negative. So already you can learn a lot of things about your function by studying the tangent line. Now the next, next come the question is how to find the equation of the tangent line. We know that it's going to, to look like this, right. Because, because all lines look like this. More precisely, all lines, which are graphs of functions, they all look like this. So which one is it? In other words, we have to find the coefficient k, and we have to find this number y0, and we have to find the number x0. That's what determines the line. As we discussed, we need x0, y0, and the slope. But we already know x0 and y0 because that's the, the reference point. That's the point on the curve to which we look for the tangent line. So we already know, know x0 and y0. And the question is how to find the slope of the tangent line, k of the tangent line. And the answer was given before in single variable calculus. And the answer is, is very nice. or one might say beautiful, okay? The answer is k is equal to the derivative of this function at the point x0. In other words, you don't need to draw anything. You don't need to make any complicated calculations. All you need to know is the derivative of your function. And usually your function is described in a very explicit way, like, you know, say, polynomial function or cosine or sine or exponential function for which you know what the derivatives look like because you've learned them from, you know, by, by, by calculating them once and then you make a list and you remember them. So, so some, taking derivative is something which, which we, um, we know well, quite well, right? So all you need to know to find the slope is to find the derivative, is to know how to find the derivative. And once you know the derivative, you know the slope, and so then you can put these things together and you get the equation of the tangent line. So the final result is that the equation um, of, the of, the, of the tangent line is just obtained by combining all this information right, and into this formula. So instead of k, you will put f prime of x0, which is what I wrote here. Right? And then you have x minus x0 plus y0. That's the equation of this tangent line. No matter how complicated your function is, the equation of the tangent line is going to always look like this. Now, 
Of course, I am cheating a little bit because all of this is applicable to functions for which the derivative exists in the first place. And not every function has a derivative. These are the so-called differentiable functions. But the functions that we are going to study in this course, they are going to be differentiable. And so, so this method will apply. So you have to realize that this is something which works in some sense for the nicest possible functions, namely differentiable functions or smooth functions, if you will, the ones for which the graph is sort of a smooth curve as opposed to a curve which has angles, which has sharp angles. Because if you have a sharp angle, it's not clear how to make a tangent line, right? It's not, it's not going to touch the graph because there is, a there is a sharp corner. So in this case, we don't consider. We only consider the smooth ones. But the, smooth, the, the class of smooth functions is, is very large. And, and we are focusing in this course on the smooth functions. So, the, so we are fine. Our method is applicable here. And once it is smooth, it has a derivative. And so you can write easily the equation of this line. That's what we've learned in single variable calculus. Now. In single variable calculus, you study graphs of functions in one variable, which are curves on the plane. And last week, we talked about more general curves. We said, OK, there, is a, there are many curves which you can get as graphs of functions, but not all. There are more general curves which are not graphs of functions. And there are two ways to represent them. One is by an equation, like x squared plus y squared equals 1, like a circle and radius 1, or in a parametric form. OK, so that, that means that we have now a larger class of curves, which includes, but not is, equal, is not equal, is bigger than the class of graphs. So now we'd like to ask the same question about these parametric curves. In other words, we want to learn how to compute the tangent line to such a, such a curve at a given point. So that's the question that we are, we are going to ask. So in other words, now we have a parametric curve, parametric curve and the parametric curve is, is given by a pair of functions, f of t and g of t, as we discussed last time, right, where t is an auxiliary variable, the parameter on the curve. And we want to learn. Um, the equation that uh, what is we want to find out what is the tangent line to um, to this curve at a given point. X zero y zero, where of course. Um, for this point, x0, y0, to belong to this, to this curve, uh, both of these values, x0 and y0, have to be values of f and g at the given parameter value, t0, right? So that would have to be f of t0, and that would have to be y0 would have to be g of t0. For some t0, some value, we'll, we'll look at examples uh, in, in a bit. So you'll see what I'm talking about. Okay, so what is the tangent line to this curve? In other words, we would like to extrapolate this formula. We'd like to generalize this formula, which, by the way, is the way mathematics is done. You know, you, you don't immediately get the answer in all cases. You, may, you work out the simplest case, and then you try to generalize. So if you look at this formula, it may, the answer may not be so obvious. Because the, here, this answer involves this function f, which, um, you know, because we're talking about the graph of a, of a function, which is really the special case, special case of the, the general parametric curves in which the parameterization is x equal t and y is equal to f of t. This, this shows you right away how special this case is. How special? Well, it's just that x is t and, and y is some function. Because if you, if you have this parameterization, then the first equation tells you that x is just t. So you can just substitute x instead of t, and you get y equals f of x. You get the graph of the function. 
So in other words, in this special case, the function f, f small, f small, is just the function t. And the function g small is another function f capital. And now we have a more general case where both f small and g small are some complicated functions which are not necessarily equal to t or anything, or anything uh, given in advance. So we need to generalize this formula, and it's not obvious immediately what the answer should be, because it really appeals to this particular case, to this very special case. But it's actually not so hard to guess the answer. But to guess the answer, we have to remember how we derive this formula in a single variable calculus in the first place. Okay? And actually, for that, I will use, I will use this picture. So you see, what is the slope? The slope is the ratio, the slope is the ratio of delta y, <coughs> delta x. The increment in y over increment in x. That's because that's how, um, let's look at the graph of the, of the line. And let's just recall. Let's just recall uh, the definition of the tangent. Because remember, k, I said k is a tangent of the angle. So what is tangent? Tangent, when you draw this triangle, is the, is the ratio of the change in y in this triangle over the change in x. So, so k is equal to delta y over delta x on this line. So for this tangent line, we, we have the same, the same thing. There is a delta y and then there is delta x. Now, so this is delta y over delta x on the line, on the tangent line. But the point is that this is approximately, that, that this increment in y for very small, on a very small scale, is almost equal to the increment in y on the graph itself. And the change in x, of course, is the same for both. So you, sh you should look at this picture and see that even though the tangent line, that it goes off on the tangent, it, they, they diverge a little bit, but not so much. And the closer you are to the point, you, actually the difference is less and less. Right? So in fact, this ratio is almost the same as delta y over delta x, but now on the graph itself. And uh, so the slope can be computed as the ratio of the increment of the function delta y, this, this, this one, to the increment in x. Right? So in other words, this is delta y on, on the tangent. Right? This is delta y on the tangent. And this is delta y on the graph. And they're almost the same. So the slope, for this computing the slope, we might as well take delta y of the graph and divide it by delta x. And when this becomes very small, when delta x becomes smaller and smaller, so you are getting closer and closer to the point, this becomes what we call the derivative, dy dx over dx, which is f prime. So that's the reason why we, you actually get the derivative, because what you get is dy over dx, and y is f of x, so dy dx is f prime uh, at your reference point f zero, uh, x zero. So that's how you derive this formula. In other words, this, this calculation is what gives you this. So now we can use the same, the same formula because we have worked out now the formula for, um, for the slope. And we see that the slope, k, again, is dy over dx. But remember, y and x are given by these formulas. In other words, y is g of t and x is f of t. So we can use that to write dx is f prime of t dt, and dy is g prime of t dt. And so what you get here is g prime <coughs> t, g 
divided by f prime of t dt. And now it's tempting to, to just cancel, cancel out these two dt's. And actually you can, you can, you are allowed to do this under some mild restrictions. We're not going to get too much into details, but I'm just giving you an intuitive derivation of the formula. But what I'm saying now can actually be made rigorous and precise. And it, it took some, you know, it took centuries to really work out all the details and to really explain what this dt really means. We'll talk more about this when we talk about differentials of functions in two and three variables. And you will see why this kind of calculation is legitimate. Because the way it is now, dt is kind of a mysterious object. And you, people, never, uh, people don't explain in a, in a book. It's not really explained what dt is. And I'm not going to explain it now. I'll just I'll explain it later. Because uh, for now, we just, we just have to sort of take it for granted, the fact that we are allowed to, to cancel them out. The only condition which needs to be satisfied is that f prime is non-zero. If f prime is non-zero, for a good reason, because if f prime is zero, you, you, you are, in this formula, you're dividing by it, so you, you're not allowed to divide by zero. So if f prime is non-zero. So this formula makes sense as long as f prime is non-zero. And the formula, again, reads just like this. More precisely, we have to say at which value of t. But remember, that's why I was careful here when we talked about the question. I said, what is the tangent line to this curve at a given point, x0, y0? And x0, y0 was a point which corresponded to a particular value of the parameter, which I call t0. So to be absolutely precise, this is a formula for the slope of that tangent line where both of these derivatives are evaluated at t0. Any questions? Why is it at t0? Because we are calculating the slope at a given point, right? And the point on a parametric curve, a point is determined by the value of the parameter. So because here, I'm sort of writing all over the place. But here, this is the answer to the question which is written in the opposite board, where t0 is introduced. So you have, to, you have to look at both of these. All right. So let's see. Um, what do we want to do with this? OK, let's, uh, let's, do, let's do an example. Let's do an example. So find, find tangent line to, to the parametric curve given by, by this equations at the point t equal 1. So this means that t0 is 1. This infamous t0, which appears appears in this formula, and this exercise is 1. Because, well, here is written t equal 1. My point is, I'm trying to use notation in the following way, that when I say t, I kind of view it as an, as an independent variable. It can take any values. But when I talk about a specific point, then I want to say that t is equal to some specific value. In a general formula, I don't want to say which value it is. 1, 2, 3, I don't want to say it, so that's why I use the notation t0. So t0 just means a particular value of t as opposed to a variable itself. It's a subtle difference. So if, you, if it's lost on you, don't worry about it too much. All right. Find the, tangent, find the equation of the tangent line. The equation of the tangent line, in the case of a graph of a function, is written here. Now, in the case of uh, curves, parametric curves, the equation is going to be y equals, I look at, I take this. I mean, the equation is always like this. And now k is equal to this. So I just substitute this k into this formula. So I get g prime of t0 over f prime of t0 x minus x0 plus y0, where x0 and y0 
other values of the function to begin with. So that's going to be f of t0, and that's going to be g of t0. So it's a very straightforward exercise because you only, all you need to do is just to calculate each of these numbers which show up here. So let's first calculate x0 and y0. Okay? x0 is going to be the value of x when t is equal to 1. Right? It's just, this is f. And this is, this is g. So what you need to do is you need to calculate the value of, of this function first at t equal 1. That's logarithm at, at 1, and logarithm at 1 is 0, exactly. Very good. So now y0 is, you calculate 1 times e to the 1. So e to the 1 is e. And if you don't remember what e is, you should, uh, should go back and read, uh, you know, math 1b. It's a, it's a particular constant which is defined by the property that the derivative of this function, e to the t, at t equals 0 is equal to 1. So it's a, it's a base of the natural logarithm. So it's a particular number, which is like 2.7. It's like, it's like pi. It's a very important universal constant. So I, I on purpose, chose this example to, because, you know, in the a, in a homework, you will, you have to deal with this constants like E and things like that. So you have to get, you have to remember them and get used to them. Okay. So it's a particular, E is a particular number. It's not a variable. It's a particular number which is equal to, I don't remember exactly, but I think something like 7, 8, 8 1, whatever. Or maybe I shouldn't write it because uh, if it's not correct, I kind of make fool of myself. All right. So, okay, so we found x0 and y0. That's great. And next, we need to find a slope. So for that, we need to find the derivatives of this. So f prime of t is 1 over t, right? And g prime of t. So again, if you don't remember how to differentiate logarithm, you have to remember it because this is something, this is something from single variable calculus. And we are going to use these results freely. We are using everything we've learned so far, which means single variable calculus. In particular, we have to know derivatives of all these functions and all the rules how to calculate derivatives like this. So g prime, you use the derivative of the product. So that's going to be e to the t plus t e to, e to the t. I'm right. oh, sorry, plus. And now, if, you, if I want the value at t equals 0, at t 0, which is 1, I'm going to get 1 for this one. And I'm going to get 2. Right? And now I need to calculate the ratio between them. So let me just write above. So I have to take the ratio of g prime over f prime. And g prime is 2e, and this is 1. So that's going to be 2 times 2e. And then I have x minus x0, which we found is 0. So actually, it's going to be 2e times x plus y0, and y0 we found to be e. So that's the answer. That's the equation of the tangent line. OK? So, so next, what, what else can we learn about this? Uh, amongst all the lines, there are special ones. There are ones which are vertical and the ones which are horizontal. So how to find out? when it's vertical or horizontal. Um, you just look at the slope. So the slope is, as a, again, is a tangent, right? So the slope is 0. The slope is 0 if and only if the tangent line is horizontal. If the tangent line tangent is horizontal. This we learned uh, in single variable calculus. But we never talked about when tangent line is vertical. And there's good reason for this, because the tangent line for a graph to a graph of a function is never going to be vertical. You kind of, if you have to think about it a little bit, and then you'll see that it's not possible. So the tangent line can only be horizontal, but not vertical in the case of a, of a graph of a function, which is our special case like this. But in the most general case, it surely can be vertical or horizontal. For one thing, you could switch x and y. 
And uh, when you switch x and y, what I mean is switching f of t and g of t, right? And we are allowed to do that because x and y are now completely on equal footing. And so if you switch x and y, a vertical becomes horizontal and vice versa. So clearly verticals, vertical tangent lines will, something, will some, be something which is, will show up as well. So the way to see that then is, um, it's better to look at this formula, at the, at the more general formula, which we have just found for the slope. And so we see that if g prime of t0 is 0, it means that the tangent is horizontal. Right? I would like to say that. But the problem is I have to make sure that this formula is valid. And the formula is valid if f prime is non-zero. So you have to have two conditions to satisfy. g prime is 0, but f prime of t0 is non-zero. And, th and this, by this, I mean, uh, I mean the, the end, the, that both conditions are satisfied. Once again, g prime is 0, but f prime is non-zero. Then it's horizontal. And uh, if, you want to, if you want to understand when it's vertical, you just switch x and y. So when you switch x and y, f starts playing the role of g, and g starts playing the role of f. So just without thinking, just switch them, and you will, you will get the condition for the vertical one, for the vertical tangent lines. f prime is 0, but g prime is non-zero. It's non-zero. That's none is vertical. So, um, so let's see. Um, let's see uh, some, some example. Um, when tangent lines are vertical or horizontal, how to find out? See, the problem is if both of them are 0, you're kind of dividing 0 by over 0. And that's really not well defined. So it really depends on the situation. It could be, um, it could be anything. So it really depends. You have to study it in more detail. But if, if just one of them is 0, but the other one is non-zero, then you can say for sure that it's vertical or horizontal, depending on which, which one is 0 and which one is non-zero. So example 2, uh, x is t times t squared minus 3, and y is 3t squared minus 3. I'm sorry, 3 times, times t squared minus t squared minus 3. So let's compute. So this is f, right? Again, this is f of t, and this is g of t. So what is f prime? Well, we can write this as t cubed minus 3t. So that's going to be 3t squared minus 3. And g prime, this is, this is now. 3t squared minus 9. So that's going to be what? 60. Right? And um, to find out when it's vertical, when it's horizontal, we have to find the values of t for which one of these two functions is 0. So f prime of t equals 0 means that 3t squared minus 3 is 0. Or in other words, 3t squared is equal to 3, which is the same as t squared is equal to 1. So there are two solutions, t equal 1 or t equal negative 1. OK, so for those values, f prime is 0. But to be able to say conclusively whether the tangent is vertical, we also have to check the values of the, of the other function, the de or more precisely, the derivative of the other function, right? So we have to substitute these two values into the other derivative. So we get g prime of 1 is 6. So non-zero, good. g prime of negative 1 is negative 6, non-zero. Again, good. Well, good in the sense that we, we caught the, a, a point, or two points in this case, at which the tangent is vertical. So what are these points? Points where tangent line, tangent, sometimes I'll just write the word tangent just to make it short, but 
It means tangent line is the same thing. The tangent line is vertical um, R, the points for, for corresponding to the value t equal 1, which is the point, if we put substitute t equal 1, we get what? 1 minus 3, so which is negative 2, right? So it's negative 2. And y, if you substitute 1, we get 1 minus 3 is negative 2 times 3, negative 6. And the second one was when t is equal to um, the negative 1. Um, so if it is negative 1, we get negative 1, right, negative 1 minus 3 times negative 1, which means plus 3, so that's 2. So that's 2. And here we put negative, here it doesn't matter because we square, so it's going to be the same, 2 and negative 6. Okay, so that's how you find. And horizontal, for the horizontal one, you have to, to do the same, but with g prime. Say g prime equals 0, which means t equal 0, right? t equals 0. And then you substitute here, and you see that f prime is negative 3, which is non-zero. So that means great. So that's, at this point, we also get a horizontal tangent line. And then you find that point in the same way. I'm not going to, to do it. I think it's clear. Simply substitute in, in, in x and y, substitute the value t equals 0. OK? Any questions? Yes? Can we find that f prime and g prime equals 0? Yes. What does that mean for f prime? Right. OK. That's, that's a good question, actually. Let me give you one example kind of to, to show you that it could be anything. Okay, a very simple example. Oh, yes, I have to repeat. And also for our worldwide audience. I hope you're being filmed. So um, the question is, give an example, example when uh, both f prime and g prime are equal to 0. And what does it mean geometrically? OK? So, so let's do this. Um, so I want to find two functions which at a particular value of a point, a uh, value of the parameter, have 0 derivatives. OK? And uh, the, the simplest function which, has, which, which could have derivative 0 is t squared. Not t because t, the derivative of t is 1, so it's a constant. It cannot be 0, right? Now, t squared already has derivative equal to 2 times t, and if t is 0, that's 0. So let's say this is t squared. Uh, t, t squared. And let's say that this one is also t squared. So in other words, what I mean to say is that x is t squared and y is equal to t squared. Right? So what does it look like? Actually, in this case, x is equal to y. So it looks like a line, right, which is kind of diagonal. In other words, the slope, the angle here is 45 degrees. The slope is 1, right? Because it's a funny thing. Yeah? You, you say this is t squared and this is t squared, which means that x is equal to y. Right? It's, like we are, it's almost like we are eliminating the parameter. But there is a catch. And the catch is we have to be careful what are the ranges of the variables, something which I mentioned at the end of uh, last lecture. Because the point is that for both positive and negative values of t, this is going to be positive or more precisely non-negative. It could be 0 or positive, and likewise here. So that's why on purpose I didn't draw the entire line, but only half of it. So the image which represents this parametric curve is this half a line. And actually, then, you have to be careful what are the ranges. I didn't say anything about the ranges. If you take just the positive ranges, positive values of t is going to be this. And if you take negative values of t, it's going to be the same thing. So it's actually, if you don't say anything about the range of t and kind of implicitly say that it's from negative infinity to positive infinity, then it's going to be this curve twice. You kind of come from, you, you, uh, you come from here, and then you come back. And if you say, say, for example, t from 0 to infinity, then you are going to, to get um, just uh, this, this half a line once. OK, so now suppose we, um, 
so we see very clearly, graphically, we see very clearly what the object is, which makes it much more, much more easy to analyze. But now let's compute the derivative. So f prime of t is 2t, and g prime of t is 2t, right? So at t equals 0, so there's a point t equals 0, which is here. This is a point t equals 0. So when t is equal to 0, both are 0. And so the slope, as I said, you cannot use this formula for the slope because you're dividing 0 by 0. But then, of course, the question, what is a slope in this case? Well, the slope is 1, right? It's sort of half a line, so you, you may feel a little bit uneasy because uh, there's no other end. But you can still think about, about the slope of this, right, of, of a tangent line. In this case, the tangent is going to be parallel. It's going to coincide with the curve itself, at least on this part, right? And so the, the slope is going to be just the slope of this curve, which is, which is 1. So you have sort of 0 by 0, but what happens is that the derivative is 0 just at this point. But outside of this point is non-zero. So you can approximate the ratio of two derivatives by the, ratio or, uh, by the ratio of these two functions, and then take t to 0. Because then what you see, what you get, you see, is 2t over 2t, and that's 1. So in this particular case, even though you cannot apply the formula, you know that the answer is 1. But to show you that you are sort of really on a slippery slope, no pun intended, <laughs> let's, suppose, let's suppose you, put, let's suppose you put, uh, put something like 5. OK, let's, 2. Let's put 2, OK? So then you have this. And so instead, it's going to be a more a sharper, a sharper line. Uh, so a steeper line, OK? So then y is going to be 2 times x. And this is y equal x. But this is y equal 2 times x. So for this one, the slope is 2, right? But the derivatives now are going to be 2t and 4t. So you see both, again, are 0, right? So, and, so f and you cannot use the formula because 0 over 0 is undeter indeterminate. And the point is that even 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 though it's again 0 by 0. But now the answer is not 1, but the answer is 2. So that sort of illustrates that 0 over 0 could actually be anything. So in these two examples, it's 1 or 2. That's right. That's right. So, so that's right. So to, to repeat, uh, he's saying that, so it looks like we're just applying the L'Hopital's rule, which I hope you remember what the L'Hopital's rule is, which is to say that, we are actually looking at these two derivatives. So now it's going to be 2t over 4t. And we don't substitute t equals 0 Im immediately in the numerator and the denominator. But we look at this function for t very close to 0. And we see, what is it? Well, if t is non-zero, this, this makes perfect sense. It's going to be 2 over 4, which is 1 half, right? Except I'm, I'm taking the ratio in the opposite order, right? Sorry. So we have to do f, g prime over f prime. So it's 4 over 2. And that's going to be so, 4 over 2, and that's 2. So the ratio itself is well defined. Even though the, if, we do it, if we substitute too, too quickly, too soon, then it will be 0 over 0. Okay? But, and then I, I, I don't want to go too much off on the tangent here. Okay? So I'll just, uh, yeah. sorry, I couldn't resist. <laughs> but, I just, I will let you play with other examples. For example, try to, to do, say, t square here, but here put t cube or something like this and see what will happen. It's really, it's, it's, a, it's a very nice uh, uh, example to consider. But let's go back to our curve. So, so now we know about tangent lines, when they are vertical, when they are horizontal. What else do we need to know? Well. In the single variable calculus, we also talked about second derivatives. So you see, the point is that the first derivative is good music. <laughs> All right. But uh, we are not here to listen to music. so. Should avoid this. 
Now, at least not during the, during the lecture. Uh, the first derivative is a slope. It's dy over dx. And it tells you the general direction of the function. If the slope is positive, it means that y is increasing as x is increasing. If, if the slope is negative, it means that y is decreasing as x is increasing. But, and oftentimes we, we call this the first order approximation. First order, now you can see why it's first order, because it's the first derivative. It's a first order approximation. And uh, oftentimes it's also good to look at the sort of second order approximation. In other words, to look at the second derivative. And the second derivative is d squared y over dx squared, or if you will, d dx of dy dx. And that's something which tells us, if you think of this as the velocity, this is acceleration. It tells you the trend. In other words, whether, say, this function is increasing, but is it increasing faster as time goes by, or is it increasing more slowly? And the way this, is, uh, this uh, can be seen geometrically is from the concavity of the function. If the function is like this, it means that the second derivative is positive. We will call this concave upward. I, I, that's what it's called in the book. I'm actually, I'm not sure. I, maybe I would call it concave downward. But that's the terminology, so we'll stick to it. So this means concave upward, upward. And it means that this is greater than 0. And um, if it's negative, it's, it's concave downward. So it looks like this. So it gives you more qualitative features of the, of, the, of the curve. So even if you cannot draw the curve right away, it tells you by calculating these derivatives, you will know uh, the ranges of parameters for which the curve looks like this, approximately, or like this. And there is a simple formula for this in terms of f and g, but uh, I will let you read the, uh, about it in the book. It, it's very straightforward, so I, I don't want to waste time on this. OK. So that's the, that's the other thing you need to know. In addition to the first derivative, which gives you the equation on the tangent line, you can also have the second derivative tell you about the qualitative behavior of the graph, kind of a second order approximation. OK. So what are we going to do next? What we're going to do next is we are going to use to talk about other features um, of parametric curves. And uh, so far we talked about so far we talked about differentiation, right? So this information about the tangent lines is, has to do with the derivatives. And now we'll talk about integrals. And integrals are not about the local behavior of the function, like the derivatives which tell us about a, a kind of a behavior of the graph on a very small scale. But integrals are about the global behavior, about averaging of the function. In other words, about areas, various areas which are related to the graphs. So, so here again, we use as a sort of a guiding principle, a guiding principle, the material that we learned in single variable calculus, and then we generalize it to the more, more general parametric curves. Namely, we, we have to remember the formula about the area under the graph of a function. So again, I go back to the single variable situation. And I'm, uh, I'm, drawing, you, I'm drawing graph of a function f of x. And suppose on the x line, on the x axis, I mark two points A and B. Okay? And I look at the graph above it. Let's assume that the graph in this range from A to B, that the graph is entirely above the, the axis, like, like shown, and not below or not like going from upper half to the or plane to the lower half plane. Let's assume for simplicity it's like this. Then we can ask what is the area which is enclosed between the x-axis, the graph, and the vertical lines, which are, which are x equal a and x equal b. 
And one of the triumphs, so to speak, of the single variable calculus was a formula for this, which I actually kind of alluded uh, to at, at, at my first lecture, and which is that this is what's called the integral. So let me say area under the graph is given by the integral of f of x dx. Okay, and this we can write as g of x b to a, that is to say g of b minus g of a, where g is the antiderivative of x. Antiderivative of f. So in other words, uh, finding areas involves integration. And this formula shows that integration is really the procedure which is, which is inverse or opposite to differentiation. Because to find the integral, you have to not differentiate this function, but rather find a function whose derivative f is. That's what we call antiderivative. So in other words, find g such that g prime is f, finding antiderivative. So that was the story. And now we would like to generalize it, because again, we view now this graph as a special parametric curve. How special the curve given by, by that parameterization, right? And now we want to generalize it to the case of a, of a parametric curve for which the functions f and g are arbitrary functions. Uh, I mean the small f and g, not the big ones which I use here, okay? So, so the question becomes, suppose we are given a parametric curve, so the same, kind of same four parametric curve. Suppose you have a parametric curve now, in a, well, bad, bad drawing because it looks exactly the same as that one. So let me make it. That's the only one I can draw. I don't know, <laughs> I don't know just a natural kind of a natural impulse. Okay, so let's say, and again we, um, we pick some interval here from A to B. And we again ask what is, what is this area? So in other words, now again, f is f of, f of t and y is g of t. And let's say t is between some alpha and beta. So that a, the, this is x, right? And this is y. So I, I call them a and b. So what are they? If t is from alpha to beta, it means that a is f of alpha and, and b is g of beta. But somehow a and b are not so important now. What is important is the values of the parameter t goes from alpha to, to beta. So now, the, again, you have to, when this kind of question is asked, you have to be careful to make sure that, that the graph is indeed above the, above the x-axis. And uh, after I write down the formula, we'll discuss briefly about what happens if it's not the case, okay? Now, the question is to generalize now this formula. And so the, and it's actually very easy because another way to look at this formula is to say that it's, it is given by the formula. It, 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 there is a way to rewrite this formula. We just have to remember that f of x is actually y. So another way to think about this formula is to just say that the integral of y dx from a to b. And so we can, now this makes sense even for parametric curves because x and y still make sense. So the area between, the, let's just say, the area of this, of this um, figure is going to be equal to the integral, again, of y dx. But the problem is that uh, the x and y are given by this as functions of, of variable t. So at first it looks a little bit like a nuisance. But, but then you have to remember that actually it's something we've learned before. When we studied integrals, we oftentimes saw that it was beneficial to 
substitute a different variable instead of x. Oftentimes, in single variable calculus, to actually technically evaluate the integral to find the antiderivative, it was oftentimes useful to make a substitution and to say that x is some function of t of some other variable. So let's just call that other variable t and say that x is equal to f of t. And then we had a formula for this, for calculating the integral in terms of this new variable t. Right? And what was this formula? Actually, it's very easy to, to write it if we just remember uh, how to compute the differential dx. So the, the main formula here is dx is equal to f prime uh, of t dt. That's what dx is. Yes? Yes, you're right. Thank you. Very good. Yeah, I should, I should develop some system of prizes for uh, those people who find this. Yeah, extra points on the, uh, I'll think about this. But, so you, you should be on the lookout because, you know, I can make mistakes, sometimes on purpose and sometimes <laughs> just because no one is perfect, you know. So in this case, I just made a mistake. So thank you for correcting me. Um, so this is, a, this is a formula we're going to use. So dx is just f prime of t, dt. And y is g of t, OK? So substituting the variable t here simply means using the old substitution formula, which would give us the integral from alpha to beta, g of t, f prime of t, dt. And that's already a very nice formula, which now does not involve x and y, but only these two functions, f and g. And so it becomes a very nice formula because just as, as, long as, you, as soon as you know what the g of t is and f of t is, you, you can calculate the area. OK? So it's, it's the same formula, but just generalized to this more general context of parametric curves. Now let's talk about the subtle point, which is what to do if in fact, um, the picture is not like this, but it also involves some part of the lower half plane uh, below the x-axis, because this happens, right? So this is something we learned even in single variable calculus. And the point here is that you see, the point is that when you write when you write this formula, if you really think of y dx, if it lies above the x-axis, it means that y is always positive. So you actually get a positive answer, which is the area. But if y is negative, then you're going to get a negative answer. So this already suggests to you that, for example, if you were to consider this case, where actually it is below the axis, what you're going to get is not this area, but this area with negative sign. Right? So minus negative the area will be equal to this integral. I, I want to write it like this, because it, in, it includes both this case, where you can just write y equals f of x, and also includes this case, where you simply substitute this. So in other words, area is, ne is equal to negative of this. The integral is negative, and area is always positive. So to, make, to get the, extract the area out of the integral, you have, to mal, you have to put an extra negative sign. So the integral is going to be negative to begin with. If you put another negative sign, the answer will be positive. So if the graph is entirely below the x-axis, you just put a negative sign. And so then, of course, there is a mixed case where it could go like this. So in this case, let's call this area A1, and let's call this area A2. So what you are going to get is the difference between the two. In other words, the part which lies above the axis is going to be to contribute with positive sign, and the part which lies below the x-axis will contribute with negative sign. So A1 minus A2 will be the integral of y dx. So whenever you, you fall below the x-axis, you are going to get negative things. 
and that, so you don't, you don't get the area, you get the negative area, minus the area. And that's why you get this formula. So that's the most general formula, which is, and the same thing will be true here. It's not going to be the area, but rather A1 minus A2 in general, where A1 and A2 mean the same thing as here. A1 is the part which is above the axis, and A2 is the part below the axis, OK? Is this clear? Yes? The graph doubles on itself. OK. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. OK. Well, that's like a doom, doomsday scenario. But so is the question is, right, so in other words, this, is not like the, this is not the worst case. You're right. So the, the, there is a worse situation when it goes like this, right? And see, the, before, when we studied graphs of functions, this could not happen, could not possibly have happened, because for each value of x, we would have just one value of y. But now, because we're doing parametric curves, anything is possible. Right? So in this case, the point, the question, so what's going to happen is, which is, OK, so the, here there is, a different, there is a different issue. In my formula, which I wrote here, I said, t goes from alpha to beta. And so I put the limits like this. And I'm assuming that um, alpha is less than beta. So smaller value of t corresponds to smaller value of x, and bigger value of t corresponds to bigger value of x, right? So then you get this formula. What could happen is that, so in this picture, the curve is traversed like this. But if the curve were traversing like this, you would get the integral in which you will s the lower limit will be bigger than the higher limit. And we make sense of that by saying that you switch the limits, but you put a minus sign. So that's another way by which you could introduce a negative sign in, in these integrals, namely in the case when the left uh, endpoint corresponds to a larger value of t. Right? So if alpha is less than, this is alpha is less than beta. So alpha goes to a which is less than b. Beta goes to b. But the other possibility could be the other possibility could be that you could have exactly the same picture, right? But But now, let's say that I could change the parameterization. For example, I could just substitute instead of t, I put negative t. So the, what was before, say, a would be, uh, would correspond to value of alpha, which is bigger than the value of beta. Right, so this is x, this is t. So then you will end up with an integral where this formula will still be correct. It will be integral from alpha to beta. But when you, st when you tr start calculating it, you will, say, you will have integral, let's say, not from 0 to 1, but from 1 to 0. And then here you'll have uh, you know, g of t and then f prime of t. So the rule is that this is the same as the integral from 0 to 1, but with negative sign. You see, so, so you have to be careful that, first of all, the thing is above the axis or below the axis, this kind of stuff, which I talked about before, right? The second subtlety is that you have to be careful as to in what direction the curve is going with respect to the parameterization. When t is increasing, are you going from left to right or are you going to, from right to left, okay? So now, to go back to this, the interesting thing that happens here is that, say, on, let's say it goes like this. So then on this segment, it will go from left to right. But then from this segment, it will go from right to left. And then we'll, again, we'll go from left to right. The fact that actually there are three different parts is not so important because the point is that in setting up the integral, we will be using not a and b for general parametric course, but alpha and beta. In other words, we'll be, we will have to specify from the beginning which branch out of these three branches we are talking about. Are we talking about the area under this one 
or the area under this one, or the area under this one. Because the formula really explicitly involves the endpoints alpha and beta with respect to T, not with respect to, um, not with respect to A and B. So usually, we would just pick a particular branch and we'll just say, in other words, we will be saying that this is, this is T equal alpha and this is T equal beta. And this segment will correspond to some other alpha beta and this will correspond to some other alpha beta. Of course, in principle, you could say, what, what is the meaning of the integral when T will go from this value to this value? And this also is very easy to figure out. But at this point, we are kind of losing the geometric meaning of this, right? So that we have a clean geometric meaning when we are talking about a branch which is kind of a, um, which doesn't double out on itself, like you said, you know, but which just, uh, you have a single branch over the segment in the X, in the X line. In principle, you could also do, you could also give an interpretation to the more general integrals, but you kind of lose the interpre geometric interpretation. So we will not do that. So we will consider the ones which have a more clear meaning like this. Okay? Does it answer your question? Okay. Any other questions? All right. So that's the integrals. And the last thing I want to talk about is... Um, um, is uh, arc lengths. So the other thing which is very interesting is to find the length of a segment of the uh, of, a, of, a, of a parametric curve. Okay. So only uh, less than ten minutes, and uh, and then you'll be free to go. All right. So let's just uh, the finish line. Okay. So, and uh, and I will be done. All of this stuff is really um, is not so difficult. I mean, if you see. In each case, there is a formula. So what I'm trying to do here today is to kind of give you an intuitive understanding of the formula, kind of introduce the formula for you and explain why it's true. But once you know the formula, you basically just have to substitute. If you look at the homework exercise, most of them is just about substituting. There are a few subtle points, and one of the subtle points is the way when you do the integral, what exactly are you calculate, calculating? Are you calculating? So you, there are subtle points about the signs. With like the ones which I mentioned here. But other than that, it's, it's, fairly, it's fairly straightforward. And likewise, what is also straightforward is, is the arc length. And so, so the, the, the question really is, what is the length, say you have a parametric curve, what is the length of the of the part of this curve between these two points. Now, of course, you can say, what, what do I mean by the length? And for this, you, you, just, you can just think of, of the same um, analogy which I explained last time, which is that think of your curve as this wire, okay? So the curve is, is curvy when you, when you look at it on the plane. In other words, you know, when I make it like this, it's curvy. But at the end of the day, I can just take it and stretch it out and measure it. Right? So that's the length. And of course, the point is when I stretch it out, it should not be stretchable. It, you know, it should be sturdy like, um, <laughs> because otherwise I can stretch it as far as I want. Right? So it has to be, when I, when I say I stretch it, I, I mean just kind of making it into a straight line segment. But I should assume that I'm not displacing anything, that it sort of has the same, uh, it, it, it's not, um, its length is something which is well defined, which is not, does not depend on me the way I hold it, right? So that's exactly this. So you just kind of take it and, 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 and put like this, and, and then of course it's clear what its, what its length is. You can measure it. So that's what we mean by arc length. So in other words, even though it is curvy, it, it has, there is a notion of a length, even, if, even for curved objects. And of course a great example of this is the arc length of a circle. A circle is curvy, right? But we know what the length is. What is it? That's right. That's, there seems to be disagreement on that. <laughs> yes? 2 pi. That's right. So, so the length of the circle is 2 pi. And that's, and that's how we... Sorry? Circumference. Circumference. That's right. 2 pi r. That's right. I'm thinking of a circle of radius 1. But if it has a radius... <laughs> okay. I think now we are in agreement, right? Circle of radius r the length will be 2 pi r. And in fact, so this is a very important, there's a very important constant showing up, which is called pi. And we'll talk about it. Have you seen the movie pi, by the way? 
Oh, you should see it. It's cool. It's kind of cool. It's one of those movies with a crazy mathematician, you know. But, but it's a cool, it's a cool movie. All right. So, settle down. Now, pi is a is this universal constant, which actually is defined by this property that 2 pi r is the circum circumference of a circle of radius r. So this is just a good example to show you that even though the circle is curvy, but there is some length, it has a length. And of course, the way you, show, you measure this length is you can think of a circle as being formed by a rope, which you kind of open up and stretch, and, okay, and you can measure it, and you can see that it's 2 pi r. But even for more general parametric curves, we have the notion of a length, and we would like to calculate it by using these functions f and g. And there is actually a very nice formula which involves integration for this. And, it's, and, and the point is that the formula is also very easy to derive. And the reason why it's easy to derive is because we model everything on straight lines. As you know, today when I started the lecture, I said the simplest curves are lines. And to, to, learn, to really understand various characteristics of complicated curves, we have to understand them first for lines, and then we kind of extrapolate, generalize to the more general curves, to the most general parametric curves. So if, we had, if our curve were in fact a line, or a line segment, we would be able to find the length very easily by using the Pythagoras theorem. By using the Pythagoras theorem. So this would be delta x. And this would be delta y. And the length would be the square root of delta x squared plus delta y squared. Right? So now we have a much more complicated curve here. But as we discussed earlier, no matter how complicated the curve is, if it is smooth or differentiable, it can actually be approximated on a very small scale. It can always be approximated by a line. Okay. So, small scale. So what it means is that we should, okay, if we just try to approximate the whole thing by a line, it's not a very good approximation. But we could break it into segments like this. And now each of those segments, each of the small segments, actually does look like a, an interval, a segment of a line. And so for each of them, you can have delta x and delta y. So, you know, so you, it, it will look something like this. Or maybe on this side, it will look like this. And then you would have, so this is just one, one of the segments which I blow up. I zoom on it, right? And so I have delta x and delta y. So then I have the, the length of this line segment, which is now going to be very, very close to the actual length. And so I'm going to approximate the entire length by the sum of the lengths of those line segments, which is kind of like a snake-like picture. Like, you know, and on each of the small segments, I have an interval. And so at the end of the day, what I'm going to get is the sum, is the integral, which looks like this, dx squared. So it's going to be kind of like delta x squared again, <coughs> plus delta y squared, but on the small, when in the limit, when, when those little pieces become smaller and smaller, it's going to be dx squared plus dy squared. And then what I'm going to do, I'm going to to put this, and this will be from alpha to beta. And then I can take this under the integral. And so what the result is going to be is that I'm going to have dx dt squared plus dy dt squared dt. So that's the answer. That's the formula for the arc length of the curve between the points alpha and beta, t equal alpha and t equal beta. And I have now given you a kind of very informal intuitive understanding of why this formula holds. It essentially comes from the Pythagoras theorem. So this was just a trick. I wanted to rewrite this. This is an, in a nicer way. So I just put this, and I put this under. OK? So we're out of time. So see you on Thursday.